Hi, good afternoon. This is the marketplace. Coming up this afternoon, Finance Minister Ken Ofriata expected to seek Parliament's approval for government to spend about 27 billion cities for first quarter of next year. That's live feed from Parliament. We're expecting the Finance Minister there any moment from now. We'll take you there live for the latest. Also, government confirms it has reached an advanced stage to purchase the 49.5% shares of Airtel in Airtel Tigo temporarily. And government says it expects power generator VRA to increase its exports of electricity in the West African subregion. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. Details right after this break. Welcome back to The Marketplace. It's been a long wait for the Finance Minister, Ken Ofriata, who is expected to seek Parliament's approval for government to spend about 27 billion CDs for the first quarter of next year. Now, this is what Joy Business has picked up as he prepares to present estimates covering expenditure and revenue targets for the first three months of 2021 to the house we'll be going to the house for the latest but here's george Raffi with some more insights into the finance minister's presentation today the I same with the, um, uh, you did i've heard okay. some, it was yeah. parliament for approval will however be slightly lower than the about 27 billion ghana cities that the finance minister is likely to seek approval the presentation is not a budget statement, but rather a move to ensure that whoever is managing the economy come January 2021 will have the legal backing to spend up to the amount being proposed. This is to ensure that whoever is managing the economy as a finance minister come next year will be able to pay salaries of workers in the public sector during that period and also take care of other pressing needs and ensure that government machinery doesn't grind to a halt. This is because the Constitution and the Appropriation Bill requires that any money drawn from the Consolidated Fund must be approved by Parliament. However, the government of the day, or whoever wins December 7 election, will have an opportunity to present the major budget in March 2021 to Parliament. However, sources say the finance minister may use today's presentation to make a strong case for improved revenue mobilization to deal with the rising government expenditure as a result of some social interventions undertaken for this year. The proposal has been influenced by the country's low revenue levels in comparison to the size of the economy. Some economists have told job business that whichever government that will take over from next year, that is 2021, might be faced with taking some tough decisions to deal with the low revenue levels and financing the high budget deficit. So there are some tough times ahead. That was George Raffish's report. As you've indicated, the finance minister is yet to appear before the, the floor of parliament. Let's take you the live where there's currently a debate going on. Um, as you can see, let's listen into what's happening right now. In conclusion, this report also does not tell us about what happened, what happened to the effectors that were seized from the small-scale mining sector. What happened to them? The report should have captured, should have captured exactly what happened to the excavators. But with these few words, I support the report. I hope that the 2020 report will deal with those matters decisively. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, if you conclude on behalf of the majority. The House attending to other business at this moment. Let's join our parliamentary correspondent Joseph Opoku Gako with the latest from there. Joseph, they are not discussing the budget, they are attending to something else. What's happening where you are? Yeah, right. Hi Joseph, can you, can you hear me Joseph? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So uh, we've just monitored the feed from Parliament. It appears the House is attending to other business. What's happening? So the House is currently dealing with the budget performance report in respect of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources for the period covering January to December 2020, uh, 2019. Uh, that's what they are dealing with. And you had um, Inusa Fuseni, who is uh, the MP for Tamale Central, asking questions about what happened to the excavators that had been 
ceased following the fight against illegal mining. And also, he's been asking questions about what has happened to the fight against harvesting of illegal rosewood in the savannah areas of the country. So the House has actually been dealing with that. We are all awaiting the arrival of the Finance Minister, Ken Ofuriata, to come deliver uh, the uh, statement in question, which is uh, something that we're expecting that uh, he'll be dealing with. In fact, we, we've gotten some details confirming the figures as Joy Business did, did put out earlier, uh, as far as the amount the Finance Minister will be requesting is concerned. Uh, let, let me just read this document to you. Uh, what the House will be doing is that the House will be seeking to give approval for the president to authorize the withdrawal of a sum of money uh, to the tune of 27.434 billion Ghana cities from the consolidated fund for the purpose of meeting expenditure necessary mm. to carry on the services of government prior to the coming into operation of the Appropriation Act in respect of the 2021 financial year. So uh, that figure has been confirmed, 27.43 billion Ghana cities. That's what the finance minister will be requesting that the House approves uh, as expenditure uh, in advance uh, going into the year 2021. We are all not too clear on why the minister hasn't arrived in the House yet. Uh, but when you look at the other paper, which outlines the business that the House is supposed to deal with, uh, this uh, presentation that the minister will be making to the House is supposed to come off after all the other businesses having to do with the Lands Ministry report is content. So for the leadership of the House, they think there is no mm. delay. They are only going by the order of business as has been outlined. But still, we've not spotted the finance minister in the House. Yet. All right. I guess the way still continues. Uh, just so we'll back with thanks for the update. We'll come back to you if there are any new developments. But joining me again uh, via Zoom is... Uh, Yaolate, who is head of financial advisory at Deloitte, as we look forward to the presentation by the finance minister. Great to have you on the program this afternoon. So we know that the finance minister was going to be seeking some 27 uh, billion uh, cities to spend in the, in, the, in the first three months of the year. Now, uh, this is an unusual presentation because we know that uh, it's an election year and we don't know which government will take over after the elections. But a few things are crucial to us. Um, election year overspending, the fact that we are dealing with a COVID-19 pandemic and it's going to continue into the next year. So I was making the point about the fact that we are expecting the finance minister out to spend some 27 billion cities in the first three months of the year for whichever government comes into power. But there are things that are crucial. For instance, the fact that we are in an election year and uh, there are concerns about election year overspending, and the fact that we're dealing with a pandemic this year as well, which would enter into the next year, which makes whatever amount, whichever government, as you spar spends in the first three months of the year, very crucial. Tell us your expectations ahead of the presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, so in terms of expectations, we are looking at governments addressing uh, about uh, three or four things. So the first one being uh, fiscal responsibility, addressing the fiscal responsibility. The second one is uh, COVID uh, opportunities or COVID programs aimed at helping business recover. And the third one is debt sustainability. Mm. And the last one is what government is putting in place to support business take advantage of the continental free trade that's yet that's to take off early next year. So on the first point, fiscal responsibility, as was announced in the COVID budget uh, sometime this year, government has so far suspended the 5% fiscal responsibility gap uh, cap on spending, mm. which means that government is going to overspend beyond the 5% that by law they were supposed to spend within. And this is much more in line with what other economies are doing, even countries in the EU, because of two uh, points. The first one being the COVID situation that we find ourselves in, government has on planned expenditure. And the second point is about shortfall in revenue. So uh, at the, in the middle of this year, government announced a shortfall in revenue about 13.7 billion, arising from oil revenue that went down by about 5.3 billion, and also non-oil tax revenue about 5.3 billion, and other revenue source about 3 billion. So in all, government's revenue shortfall was about 13.6 billion. In addition, government has overspent, overspent about 11.7 billion on COVID allegation programs to date. 
So as you know, we are heading towards a deficit situation. Our only concern is that governments should try and stay within the global average about 13.9%. So other countries have suspended their fiscal responsibility gap, but they plan not to go beyond 13.9% of GDP. And we, we are just advising government that in, 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 in as much as they incur pre-election expenditure, COVID alleviation programs and the likes, they should try and stay within the 13.9% global average. If you go beyond that, then it's going to take a long time for us to recover from the pandemic and the adverse effect of the pandemic. Mm. The second uh, thing that we also expect from government is programs that are aimed at helping businesses recover from the adverse effect of the pandemic. As you know, some sectors like the hospitality industry, aviation, oil and gas really suffered because of the adverse effect of the pandemic. We do not expect increases in taxes that will cause these companies to really collapse. Mm. We are expecting tax incentives that will stimulate the growth of these sectors as opposed to taxes that will cripple them. Okay, and, and then, you, you yeah, mentioned the right. issues of debts because uh, that has come up in the last couple of weeks as well. The fact that our debt stock is rising. And so for anybody who is planning the first three months of next year, what would, you, what would be your major consideration? I think the good point here is that government should fairly balance overspend within this period to alleviate the effect of the COVID and then balance it fairly with our uh, debt levels. Our country has been classified as a high risk country in terms of potential debt distress. We are not HIPIC as has been clarified, but we are high risk countries, one of the sub-Saharan countries that have been classified as high risk in terms of debt distressed countries. Right. So in right. order to avoid that, uh, I, I like the fact that government is now looking at opportunities within um, the British Hood institutions to get debt forgiveness or debt cancellation. And I think it's one of the policies that we should pursue. Right about 2001, we also found ourselves in the same situation. In 2001, by the end of 2000, our debt to GDP ratio was 70%. And as we speak, we are about 76%. So the factors are still there, and there's the need to go for some debt relief, debt cancellation, or debt support from our development partners. Uh, otherwise, you will struggle to recover from the pandemic. I, I, are you one of those who think who thinks that, uh, you know, even though our debt levels are rising, we are, we are well able to manage the situation? Because the IMF it seems to suggest that well, even though there is a problem there, they are quite confident we are able to manage it. Yes. And the fact is, the, the difference is in two strands. So in 2001, our projected debt GDP ratio in 2001 was over 100%. Even though by the end of the year 2000, we were 70%, our projected debt GDP ratio a year after was going to be over 100%. So there was a clear case that we had to opt for the HIPIC initiative. But as we speak, our projected debt GDP ratio is about 76%. So next year, we are likely to go around 78%. So we are not going above the 100% mark. So there is a quite a, a difference here because of factors such as the rebasing of our economy. So we have a stronger base and we are able to absorb more debt. But then the risk is still there that as you keep uh, borrowing, we are still exposing ourselves or taking ourselves to the point where we become a debt stressed country and so government should keep its eye particularly on external borrowing because the problem with external borrowing is that you have two factors you have high interest payments and then exposure to exchange rate depreciation so the, the problem we have now is that our external debt borrowing is about 35 percent almost um uh, more than 50 percent of our total uh, borrowing so we should keep an eye on external borrowing and then avoid exposing ourselves to exchange rate risk as well. Okay, uh, we are not making so much noise about this presentation because obviously it's just for the first three months of the year, it's not a major thing, but really how crucial is it for any government that is going to win power in December that this, uh, whatever is aligned today, it's on point? I think governments should uh, be mindful of the fact that, I mean, there are two things. So the incumbent government wins power and then comes back. Mm. Now, if you win power and you come back, and then the economy has gone deeper into a hole, it takes you a long time to recover and begin to implement the program that you promised uh, in the electorate. 
So government should be mindful of the fact that if you go deeper into the hole, it will take you a long time to be able to implement the program that you've promised. And also when there's a, the, the table turns and it goes the other way, then you still have the problem of having had to deal with these issues by a different government. So I think that government should fairly balance all the programs that it's implementing, all the pre-election expenditure in line with its plan to recover the economy post the pandemic. Otherwise, it will take us a long time. As we speak, the Economic Intelligence Unit has projected a contraction of the economy. We are going to a recession. Right. That's the first time in about five years that Ghana economy is going to a recession. So if you go into a recession, it's going to take us a year or two to recover. And so government should be mindful that it doesn't overspend beyond the target that's set for itself. All right. Yaolati, Head of Financial Advisory at Deloitte, uh, Ghana. Thanks very much for your time and your uh, insights this afternoon. We keep waiting for the finance minister. I don't know if we can show parliament right now as you continue to monitor the feed from there. Um, as we await the finance minister to make that presentation of the interim budget for the first three months of next year, would we'll certainly take you there when he arrives. We are monitoring for you and hopefully talk about our expectations for the finance minister's presentation uh, later in the day. But let's move to some other developments in the telecom sector. Government has confirmed it has reached an advanced stage to purchase the 49.5% shares of Airtel in Airtel Tigo temporarily. According to a statement from the Communications Ministry, it has gone far with discussions with Airtel Tigo to transfer Airtel shares to government. Now, the government is optimistic it will conclude the deal shortly when definitive agreements are made between the parties, but it is expected to hand over the shares later. Government assured the protection of interests of all employees, customers and stakeholders, and a continuation of the digital transformation in Ghana. Bati Airtel, an Indian-owned company, yesterday announced in a statement that it would sell its 100% shares of the Ghana business for $25 million to the government of Ghana. Now, we are also following that for you to bring you updates subsequently in future. All right, in other news this afternoon. Uh, government says it expects power generator Volta River Authority to increase its export of electricity in the West African sub-region. Senior Minister Yao Safumafo explains this is the sure way of saving government the burden of spending $500 million annually for power the nation does not use. The Energy Ministry has in the past blamed the John Mahama-led NDC administration for signing power purchasing agreements that have resulted in the nation having access to more power than is needed. The senior minister has been given an update on the way forward at a ceremony to launch the 60th anniversary of VRA here in Accra. We are all witnesses to the four year of doing so prior to the coming into office of the NPP administration. The Dimso brought in its wake panic reaction from the then government, which went into signing a lot of power purchase agreements with independent power producers, IPPs. This resulted in installed capacity of 5,083 megawatts, according to the Energy Commission, when Ghana's peak demand for electricity is about 2,700 megawatts. Of the total installed capacity of 2,300 megawatts has been contracted on a take or pay basis. 2,300 megawatts has been contracted in agreements on a take or pay basis. The net effect is that government has had to pay over 500 million US dollars annually for power generation capacity it does not need. 500 US dollars for power generation capacity it does not need. It is my hope, and I'm calling on VRA because a special assignment, that the VRA with their rich experience will, will explore the export market to reduce the burden of this overcapacity for the government. And since they've already attracted the capacity to export to our neighbors. Now we have excess capacity. Please increase the export ability of yours 
to make sure that our take and pay burden is reduced. And finally for us uh, this afternoon. Businesses have been admonished to review written contracts prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. This will enable them to identify their fundamental obligations under the contracts and juxtapose that with current reality. Contracts specialist Tunisi Amuzu, who is also a lawyer at GIMPA, leaves due to the negative impact of the virus, agreement partners need to meet each other halfway. He disclosed this at a meeting of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Tema. There's more in this report by Kwame Yanka. Prior to COVID-19 becoming a pandemic, businesses across the world have their own forecasts for 2020. However, after several months into the health crisis, some businesses home and abroad are tanking, bearing the brunt of the outbreak. Is there any window of opportunity to salvage contracts signed prior to this? Lawyer Tunis Amuzu is asking businesses to run to Contract Act of Ghana to help salvage impact of COVID-19 on agreement. So you start by identifying your fundamental obligations under your contract and compare it to what is happening. Then you can conclude that your contract is frustrated or not frustrated. Fortunately, the Contract Act of Ghana has provisions on what parties can benefit from uh, or how the consequences of frustration should be treated. And it is a good idea that companies familiarize themselves with these provisions and take advantage of these uh, provisions. It will be good that after reviewing these positions, businesses are able to get back to the negotiation table with their partners and uh, discuss. Martin Lawyer and Director of Temaport, Sandro Poku, wants individuals and companies to understand fine details before signing contracts. And we assume a lot. We don't read the fine details and then we just sign. And so I think that there needs to be a lot of education. If you're going into business, you should, you know, get a lawyer, you should get people who understand uh, the business, and then they can advise you properly on how to do your documentation before you start paying money to anybody or you start importing. And most of the time, the importers don't know much about the details and how to fill in the documentation. So they rely on the uh, shipping agents or the uh, clearing agents. I think for the clearing agents, majority of them understand the documentation that needs to go into it. And so even before you decide to import, you can go to give headquarters and let somebody there you know, be nominated for you to take you through the documentation before you sign anything with the seller, whether in the Far East or Europe, before you sign and bring in your goods. Meanwhile, Tema Regional Chair of Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Isaac Yusif Barry, shares how an unexpected occurrence ruined his contract. I was to deliver some things to Nigeria, but I couldn't make the time because of the truck carrying the goods got spoiled on the way for about two weeks. And we came a whole lot of problems for me. I have to be how to even resolve it. Took, it cost me a lot to be able to resolve it. But that's why resolving it, I don't think it should be repeated. And I don't think any other business person should fall into that same type of this thing. That's why I'm organizing this meeting to really learn from the resource persons who that came. I think we are witnesses. They gave us some concrete evidences from their own ends. And you could see how we should the right uh, uh, clauses that we should put in our agreements. Businesses are expected to take a different approach to contracts after having participated in the event. Kwame Yankel reports for Joy Business. All right, and